been. This morning, week three of our five-week series, Little Book, Big Message, studying through the single chapter books of the Bible. We've studied the little books of Obadiah, um, of Philemon, and now this morning we've got 2 John. And 2 John is the shortest book in the Bible by verses. It has only 13 verses, but 3 John next week has it beat by word count. So 2 John contains 245 words in the original Greek. Compare that to 3 John 219. Um, it is one of five books along with 1 and 3 John and the Gospel of John and the book of Revelation that was authored by the Apostle John, the beloved disciple of Jesus. And the big message, just to go straight to the point this morning, the big message of 2 John is very simple. Love needs truth. That's the big message of 2 John for this morning. Love needs truth. Listen to how the Apostle Paul describes the process of sanctification in his letter to the Ephesians. Paul says, speaking the truth in love, the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. So according to Paul, sanctification, you're growing up in every way into Christ. That is the goal of all of the Christian life. And Paul says that we do it by speaking the truth in love. Now, we need to be honest this morning, you and I, enough to admit that every single one of us here in our sin, we struggle greatly with speaking the truth in love, don't we? With holding those two things together, truth and love, in, in the perfect, ideal, Christ-like balance. 90% of you all are prone to speaking half-truths in so-called love. Right, when the truth is going to be hard for you to say and or hard for the other person to hear, you say something less than the truth instead in the name of love. And then there's the 10% of us weirdos who are inclined to speak the truth in hostility when need be. So to us, if you need the truth spoken to you, it's got to be because of your sin, and we're not supposed to love sin. We're supposed to hate and kill sin mortify the flesh, and so I'm going to aggressively speak the truth. I'm picturing this, like the scene in the movie Saved, if you've seen that, where Mandy Moore throws her Bible at Jenna Malone uh, for failing to listen to the truth. you got to see it. It's a good movie. Um, now, you love people will be happy to hear, spoiler alert, that the big message of 3 John for next Sunday is that truth needs love. But truth, people, this is our week, okay? So 2 John is all about love needing truth. And here's perhaps the most important thing uh, that needs to be said right up front about this relationship between the two is that truth and love are not at odds with one another. All right, so I, I, as I even describe this, we shouldn't be envisioning them as opposite ends of, of a pole, of a, of a spectrum, as if they're in tension with one another. Rather... We ought to envision truth and love as two sides of the same coin. So genuine love is always truthful, and godly truth is always loving. But while love and truth are never opposed to one another, the Bible's portrayal of that symbiotic relationship between them is itself diametrically opposed to the understanding that has been adopted by our surrounding culture today. Our culture today says your ability to love others is directly proportional to your ability to be flexible with your notion of the truth, doesn't it? To love others, according to the world, is to validate them. It's to affirm their truth. So according to the world, the more rigid and inflexible and absolute your idea of truth gets the less capacity you have to love and approve of others. But according to God's word, as we're going to see this morning, your ability to love others depends directly on your willingness to be unwavering in your commitment to the absolute truth of the word of God, both in its written form, the Holy Scriptures, and its incarnate form, Jesus, the Son of God. 1 Corinthians 13, 6 says, Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with what? The truth. And so love always aims at truth. It always supports truth. They 
are not and cannot be at odds with one another. And this morning, as we dissect John's second epistle together, he's going to give us four reasons that love needs truth. So would you stand with me as we read the entire letter of 2 John, 13 short, power-packed verses. Hear the word of the Lord. The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in truth and love. I rejoiced greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting, for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister greet you. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Pray that it would convict us as it promises to in your word. You say it's a double-edged sword piercing through us to both convict and encourage us. And so I pray that you would do that this morning through the power of, of your word as we submit ourselves under its authority. Uh, God, some of these truths are hard to hear, but they're so important. And true love always is just that, true. It's truthful. And so we thank you for your truth. We thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Love needs truth for four reasons. Number one, truth is the foundation for love. It's the foundation. Listen to how every part of John's salutation here in verses one through three points us to love's foundation in the truth. Even the way John signs and addresses the letter, he opens, the elder to the elect lady and her children. He doesn't say the Apostle John to the church of fill in the blank. We're not sure which city he's writing to. Why doesn't he? My hypothesis is that he doesn't identify himself as John because what is important here in context is not the personal nature of who's writing. John is not appealing to them on the basis of his personal connection either to the church itself or even on the basis of his connection to Jesus. He doesn't say, listen to me because I'm your good old buddy John. And he doesn't even say, listen to me because I was one of Jesus' closest friends. Instead, he says, I am the elder. What does an elder do? Why is that, why is that important here? Here's why the Apostle Paul instructed Titus to appoint elders in every town was to give instruction in sound doctrine, and also to rebuke those who contradict it. That is why John is writing them as their elder. Why doesn't he just call them the church at such and such a city? I think it's because by referencing the elect lady and its individual members as her children of this church, he is subtly reminding them of three of the absolute core 
doctrines, truths of the Christian faith. Number one, their election. He says, you're the elect lady. God chose them. Jesus says in John 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Number two, not only did Christ call us to himself, he has now united us with himself. We are his lady, his bride, the elect lady, the bride of Christ. New Testament metaphor, picture of, of Jesus' relationship with his church. And that makes us now, number three, children of God. To the children, we are adopted sons and daughters of God most high. But in case that salutation was, was too subtle about this whole truth and love, John lays the truth on really thick in the rest of his opening here. He says, I love you in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Translation, I love you in truth. In other words, the basis for the love that, that I have for you is our common commitment to the truth. Secondly, also all who know the truth. In other words, the basis for all of Christian love is our common belief in the truth, the gospel. And then number two, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. What's he talking about there? What's the truth that abides in us? It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Jesus called him the spirit of truth in John 16. He is Jesus' own spirit. Behold, Jesus had promised us, Matthew 28, I will be with you always. Jesus himself, who is the way, the truth, and the life, now lives in you, abides in you if you are in him, if you are an adopted son, daughter of God. Christ now lives in you, his Holy Spirit, and it is only because he does that we are able to love one another, John says. The Holy Spirit setting up shop in our hearts means that not only is truth now abiding in us, empowering us to love one another in Christ, but verse 3, he says, grace, mercy, and peace will be with us too. It's like bonuses. Grace, mercy, and peace. Let's pause and just appreciate three more core truths of the Christian faith. There is a progression of doctrinal truth that John is communicating to us here. Grace, God's undeserved gift of his son Jesus. Mercy, through Jesus, through that gift, we now have received forgiveness for our sins, which leads to now, number three, peace. We have been reconciled to God because of his mercy, by the substitutionary atoning death of Jesus Christ in our place on the cross to satisfy the otherwise just wrath of a holy God against sin. That's the gospel. Brothers and sisters, grace, mercy, and peace will now be with us forever. Praise God. They are number three, or verse three. They're from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son, and how are they now applied to us? They come to us, go figure, in truth and love, verse 3. From Christ in truth and love. Jesus faced the cold hard truth of your sin, the reality of my sin, and its rightful consequences on the cross for you, for me, and he did it in love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, 1 John 4, that God sent his only son into the world to be the propitiation for our sins, to pay the price for you and me on the cross. Praise God. And so truth is the foundation for love. It's the basis for love. Truth produces love. Peter says it this way, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, Love one another now earnestly from a pure heart. God wants us, his children, to love one another, but the only way we're going to be able to is by having our souls first purified by our obedience to the truth. If you haven't been born again as a result of your saving faith and the truth of the gospel message, if you have not first been transformed by the truth of Christ's love for you, then you don't even have a prayer of loving someone else well, selflessly. We love because why? He first loved us, right? Number two, why does love need truth? Because truth is the manifestation of love. Verse four, John says, I rejoiced greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, 
just as we were commanded by the Father. Last time John was passing through uh, town and visited this church, he was encouraged to see that some of its members were walking in the truth. Now in verse 7, in a moment, we're going to discover that not all of them were walking in the truth, hence the impetus behind John sending this letter. But verse 5, he commends them. And then he exhorts them. He says, I ask you, dear lady, dear church, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one we've had from the beginning. John says, this this commandment isn't anything new. I didn't make it up. It's not a Johannine original. It's the same one that the church was founded on. And it was new only when Jesus delivered it. John 13, 34, Jesus himself said, a new commandment now I give you that you love one another. And so John is simply calling them back here once again to that same love that Christ called them to in the first place. And he clarifies it and he defines it for us in verse 6. This is the manifestation of love. He says, this is love. How does love manifest itself? This is love that what? We feel all the feels. It's love and emotion. That we affirm one another's truths. Is love just some kind of relativistic validation of the other? No, John says this is love, that we walk according to God's commands. 1 John 5, 2, this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. Our relationship with God is a child-parent relationship. God is our Heavenly Father. If I ask my daughter Ellery to go please feed the dog, if she loves and respects me, what's she going to do? She's going to feed the dog. It's pretty straightforward, right? God has given you and me, he's left us a set of commands that reflect his priorities in our lives, in our world, and yes, they do ultimately boil down to the, the two great ones, love God and love neighbor, but God goes to the trouble and the rest of his word, New Testament actually spelling out how We are to love one another. What does it mean to love God and others? Let's just take the second greatest commandment, to love one another. God specifies what he means by that with 44 one another statements in the New Testament. Honor one another, instruct one another, greet one another, serve one another, bear with one another, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgive one another, submit to one another, admonish one another, encourage one another, pray for one another. The list goes on, 44. But the most commonly repeated summary of all of them is what? Love one another. Now, we need to pause for a moment and consider this question. How is it that God can command us to love one another? How how, how can you command someone to love? This goes against everything, again, that our, our society tells us about the way that love works. If love is just a a feeling, an emotion, I I want you to imagine a scenario with me. Imagine a couple walks into a therapist's office for marriage counseling, and the counselor counselor asks, what brings you in to see me today? And the husband says, we've been having issues for years now, but I only recently realized what's really at the heart of the problem. I just don't love her anymore. I loved her when we got married. I think even when the kids came along, Somewhere along the way since then, it stopped, and I no longer love her. Now imagine with me, the counselor turns and looks at the wife in tears, turns back to the husband. He says, I've got good news. You're in luck. I think I've got some advice that can save your marriage today. You ready for it? Love her. The problem is you don't love her. Here's some advice. Love her. And the husband looks at the counselor confused. The wife looks up wondering if this is some kind of sick joke. The counselor just repeats it again. Yeah, no, my my advice is definitely, actually, you know what? Scratch that. Not advice. This is a command. Love her. That ought to fix your problem. Commentator Stephen Smalley explains, love can be commanded in as far as it is not simply an emotion, but the obedient response of a believer which belongs to the sphere of selfless action. Remember how Jesus himself defined love. He said, greater love has no one than this, that he what? That he feel really good toward his friends? He laid down his life for his friends. He didn't say anything about feelings. John defined it this way in his first, his first letter to the church. 
said, by this we know love. That Jesus felt really caring toward us. Doesn't say anything about feelings. That he laid down his life for us. and We ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. See, that's the great thing about true love. Biblical love, Christ-like love, is it doesn't depend on your feelings. Listen, feelings are going to come and go. If they are the basis for your marriage, for any of your relationships, for your decision-making, I, I fear for you. You know how Jesus felt the night before his crucifixion in the Garden of Gethsemane? He felt like he would rather not have to hang on a cross for you. That's what he prayed to the Father. Father, if, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. I don't feel like hanging on a cross tomorrow. But not my will, but yours be done. And he did it, even though he didn't feel like it, because love isn't a feeling, it's a choice. And if you and I truly love God, we will choose to walk in his commands because love is manifested in truth. Faith without works is what? It's dead. Number three, love needs truth because truth is a requirement for love. Truth is a prerequisite for love. This is the inverse point of point number one. Point number one was that if we share truth in common, then we will also be able to share love because truth is the foundation for love. But point number three inverts that and says, if we do not share truth in common, then we cannot share love, at least not in the purest sense of a true gospel community. In fact, John is going to tell us in verses 10 and 11 that the most loving thing that you can do for someone who rejects the truth and is teaching others to do the same, leading others astray. Notice John is specifically discussing false teachers here in verses 10 and 11, but he says the most loving thing you can do for, for someone like that is to refuse to even associate with them. Don't, don't even so much as greet them. Now that seems harsh to us today. Because we are used to driving by churches every day in our city that proudly proclaim all welcomed here, usually in big, bold, rainbow letters, right? After rereading 2 John this week, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm going to ask Thad to work on a banner for us that we can hang out that says, some welcomed here. Fine print below. See 2 John verse 7 for info on whether you will be welcomed. Kidding aside, it's simply not biblical to welcome everyone at church. <laughs> that sounds heretical to say, but I'm just reading God's word to you. Do not receive him, John says. It's ironic that I felt led to write that article on hospitality this past week. We Christians should be, of all people, the most hospitable, friendly, welcoming people in the world when it comes to everybody except two types of people. Number one, got to go elsewhere for this one, 1 Corinthians 5, self-professing Christians living in unrepentant sin. We don't welcome them. 1 Corinthians 5, you remember the church member is having an affair with his stepmom. Paul says, kick him out. <laughs> Purge the evil person from among you. Do not associate with anyone who bears the name of a brother if he's guilty of sexual immorality or greed, an idolater, reviler, drunkard, swindler, don't even eat with such a one. For what, I, I, I'm not here to judge outsiders. Like why would we expect the world to, to live up to you know, God's standards? But we should expect one another to. You judge those in the church. We are called to, to, judge, to hold one another to Christ's standard. So if you remember here at West Hills, be honest with any of y'all, all the new people coming who might be interested exploring membership down the road, just want to be, be forewarned, be upfront with you. If it comes to light that you're cheating on your wife, or cheating on your taxes, or cheating on your church membership commitment to gather regularly with the, the bride of Christ by idolatrously worshiping at the altar of youth sports instead on Sundays, 
guilty of sexual immorality, greed, idolatry, any of these, these sins, as a church, we're going to come to you once, as Jesus instructs us to in Matthew 18. We're going to speak the truth in love to you. Hey, brother, sister, we love you too much to watch you stray from the truth and submit once again to a yoke of slavery, to sin, and darkness. Come back to the light. We're going we're to lovingly call you to that. And if you refuse, we will put you out of the church and treat you as a Gentile or a tax collector, as Jesus says. We don't hate Gentiles and tax collectors. We just don't fellowship with them. We don't share the, the love of Christian, uh, bond of Christian love and fellowship. We don't condemn them. Remember, Paul says we don't judge them at all. Once you're put out of the church, it's, it's God's job to judge you. Our job is to pray for you. It doesn't mean you've got to be perfect to join the church. It just means that if you see some imperfection in me or I in you, we ought to lovingly confront one another about that sin because we ought to care too much to let one another drift away from the Lord. That in my, in my sin, yes, I may bristle at that at first. I may get defensive. So who, lo- who likes to be called out, confronted? But a true Christian, a true Christian in time will thank you for helping her see her blind spots. That is part of God's good design for us in Christian community. The famous Proverbs 27, 17 passage that everyone loves. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Have you ever seen iron get sharpened? It's a violent, abrasive process. Sparks may fly, but it is good for us. True love is good for us. It is willing to confront us in the truth. Round out our rough edges. So, We do not welcome, number one, self-professing Christians living in unrepentant sin. And number two, back to 2 John now, we do not welcome false teachers. John calls them deceivers, verse 7. He calls them the Antichrist, verse 8. Commentator David Allen explains the word Antichrist here means against Christ. John does not mean that any one of these false teachers is the personal Antichrist spoken of in the book of Revelation as the final world ruler who opposes Christ just before his second coming. Rather, any and all false teachers partake of the character of the final Antichrist. The spirit, John says, of Antichrist is already at work in the world. And so who are these deceitful, Christ-opposing false teachers that John's talking about here? He identifies them in verse 7 as those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Did you know that every pseudo-Christian heresy out there for the last 2,000 years, every counterfeit gospel shares one thing in common. They all are just a little off in their Christology, their view of Christ, their understanding of who Jesus was. Jesus is the center of the Christian faith, right? Every heresy that has ever been invented in, in church history shifts that center just a little bit ever so slightly, one direction or the other. Usually either over or under emphasizing his humanity or his divinity. Jesus was perfectly God and perfectly man. So here's the example in context. The immediate context here, Second John, is the, the early, one of the earliest heresies in the, in the church, Gnosticism. Gnosticism taught that the physical world is inherently evil. Therefore, Jesus only appeared to come in the flesh. Jesus was fully God, not fully. He appeared to be fully human. His true mission was to liberate our souls from their bondage to our fallen bodies. Everything physical is inherently evil, this fallen material world. So he's got to liberate us through gnosis or this special esoteric revealed spiritual knowledge. And evidently, some of these early Gnostics had discovered that when when you have access... To that gnosis, when you have even a monopoly on that special revealed knowledge that is allegedly necessary for salvation, for escaping this physical world, achieving this higher spiritual plane of existence, enlightenment, some folks are willing to pay top dollar for it. That's, that's another thing that heresies tend to share in common. They all chase power and money. This is what L. Ron Hubbard, 
a great sort of modern day example of something close to Gnosticism, founder of Scientology, uh, discovered. Hubbard was relatively unknown science fiction writer who came to recognize both this, this inherent need in humans to make sense of our universe, and so he created a whole sci-fi universe that I guess some people believe in, and also our compulsion to earn our own salvation. In most religions, that's doing good works, but in Scientology, it literally means purchasing access to deeper and deeper levels of the secret knowledge passed down. Hubbard actually joked about it off record, but it was overheard and recorded. Look, if you want to get rich, don't write sci-fi, just start a religion. So that's what he did. And John mocks that kind of buy your way up through the ranks thinking here. In verse 9, he writes, Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ. The Greek verb there is proago. It's evidently uh, the word that Gnostics use to, to hook and deceive these immature Christians in John's churches. It was this idea of you can, you can go on ahead, you can advance if they were still around today, they'd be holding special $600 seminars called Propel or Advance. Um, John warns, if you are advancing past the teaching of Christ, then you've advanced right out of the faith. You no longer have God, he says. So John exhorts them in verse 8, watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. John is not warning them here that they might lose their own salvation. We know biblically you can't lose your salvation any more than you can work for it in the first place. Salvation comes by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, not by works, lest anyone should boast. So what is John referencing here? I think he's exhorting the teachers, leaders of the church, the elect lady who have been working for the sake of their children, verse 1, those younger, more immature, perhaps more impressionable uh, believers, may, they make for easier prey for these Gnostic false itinerant teachers because they don't know enough of the truth yet. They aren't firmly rooted enough in the truth of the gospel to be able to smell a fake when it comes along. And so John warns the church leaders, listen, you've been ministering to these spiritual babies, newborns, and trying to disciple them up. But if you, if you quit paying attention now, if you lose them to these Gnostics, if they leave the true faith, then you lose your reward. You lose that, that jewel in your crown. And so John had already addressed this in his first letter to them. He said, children, it's the last hour. As you've heard, the Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. They went out from us, but they were not of us. Or if they had been of us, they, wouldn't, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain they are all not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. John says, they don't have any secret knowledge. That is all smoke and mirrors. You have the knowledge that you need. Second Peter 1 Peter 1.3 puts it this way. God's divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him, Jesus, who called us to his own glory and excellence. You have all the knowledge you need. You don't need to pay for some special... That's not how the gospel works. And so here's what I want to do quickly in our remaining time. I want to warn you today so that we can heed John's exhortation in verse 8 to watch ourselves. I want to quickly get on your radar three, I think three modern day false teachings, heresies that I see as being perhaps most threatening to the 21st century American church. And because all heresies can be traced back to a wrong view of Jesus, I'll point that out as well. So the first heresy is prosperity teaching. Prosperity teaching, the so-called health and wealth gospel, God's deepest desire is to make you rich and happy in this life, just turns Jesus into my errand boy. He is my own little personal genie. God, God wants to, God exists for me. Jesus is even better than a genie because usually genies only give you three wishes. But Jesus is here by my side, not me by his side, he's by my side so that the blessings in this life are just never ending. The problem is that Jesus himself told his would-be followers in his day that foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. If you follow me, you're going to be homeless, like me. A servant is not above his master. If they persecuted and killed me, they're going to persecute and hate you. How is that for blessing in this life? That's what Jesus promised. The second false teaching is progressive teaching. So-called progressive church who believe God's self-revelation 
is progressing over time. God is still speaking today is the slogan you'll see on their church banners sometimes. What they mean by that is that the Bible isn't sufficient today. It was fine maybe 2,000 years ago, but periodically God needs to make some updates. And so he's still speaking to us today, and occasionally he, that means he needs to contradict himself. So like, you know, that stuff I'm in about gender and sexuality, back 2000, you know, you get the picture. So for them, Jesus is their example. He can't be their savior because that would imply they need saving, which would imply there's something wrong with them, which is anathema in the whole progressivist movement. Remember, love equals unqualified validation, affirmation. So Jesus gets reduced to merely an example to be imitated. The problem with progressivism is that Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned. There is something wrong with us. Romans 6.23 warns us that the wages of that sin is death. So you and I need much more than an example. We really do need a Savior. The third and most subtly deceptive, potentially dangerous of all the deceptions, I think just because of its sheer pervasiveness, is productionist Christianity. This is when the church becomes a business and those in attendance become consumers. You all are the consumers. And the product that I am up here trying to sell you every Sunday is Jesus. Some countries export lumber, some export coal. The church exports Jesus. He's our product. So we begin to measure our success by the number of buyers and by the amount spent on him, the cheeks and the seats and the checks and the offering plates. Let me tell you, it is everywhere. This false teaching is everywhere in the American evangelical church today. Every other so-called evangelical church, maybe more. And the problem with productionist Christianity is that Jesus does sell. You can get by with it. He does sell to an extent. God so loved the world. God so loved me. I'll buy that. God hates your sin and calls you to leave it and follow him. Doesn't, doesn't feel as nice. I don't, know, I don't know if I want that. Jesus wants to be my savior, to save me from the penalty of my sin, death and hell. Bye, bye, bye. Jesus wants to be my Lord, to move into every area of my heart, set up shop and call me to repent of my sin, live differently. Ah, man, I don't know. Sounds like work. And so productionist Christianity may start out aiming to preach the gospel in a way that appeals to the biggest crowds, but as it begins to realize that the gospel is a stumbling block and offensive, and you can draw bigger crowds with a slightly modified, tweaked gospel, it slowly over time begins to compromise the truth in subtle but significant ways to make for itself a product that is easier to sell. Friends, Orthodox Christianity, or if you want to stay with the alliterations, the pure gospel is this. Jesus isn't your errand boy. He's not just a good example. He's not a product to be exported. He ought to be your everything wants to be, he deserves to be our everything. He's not interested in being your savior if he can't be your Lord as well. Like a good church, Jesus loves you enough to accept you just the way you are. You don't have to clean up your act to come to him, but he loves you too much to leave you dirty once you do. He's not going to leave you that way because love needs truth, and the truth is that you and I are sinners in desperate need of saving and sanctifying Grace, praise God, he has freely shown it to us in the gift of his son, Jesus. It's the gospel. Finally, number four, truth is the empowerment for love. Truth enables us to love. It empowers us to love. Far from separating us from one another and other true believers, telling a true believer the truth in love ought to draw you closer together. Like if, we're, if, if we're not close enough to, t- to be honest with one another, what do we really have, right? How's that any different than, than what the world has? And so John concludes in verse 12, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be 
complete. He says, and oh, by the way, you're not alone in your fight to cling to the truth in, in this world full of lies. Verse 13, the children of your elect sister greet you. John says, the church that I'm visiting this month, they greet you, and next month I hope to come and visit you in person. So I'll, I end here. I couldn't help but close by translating verse 12 into our modern day context for our brothers and sisters who are uh, still at home joining us virtually. So I'll end here. I would rather not use video. Instead, I hope that you will come to us and meet again face, face to face so that our joy may be complete. As I said earlier, I'm encouraged. It sounds like many will begin returning Many of you already returned. Holly and Ryan are back. I mean, it's, it's wonderful to see uh, those who have been away begin to return. I hope that you all at home will consider doing that, especially for Easter, joining us even if it's outdoors. The church is not the same when we're not in person to share that love and truth. More importantly, you are not the same when you're not with the gathered church. You need the truth. We need this, don't we? It is hard enough out there living in this world six days of the week without forgoing, forsaking, meeting, gathering with the gathered church on Sundays as a course corrective, as a recentering on the truth. We need this. We need to be gathered around God's word, to be recentered on the truth weekly, probably daily. You ought, you ought to be doing that for yourself daily, and this is just the pep rally. And so I thank God that I am able in love to remind even those of you still at home of that truth that you need to be here because of the love that we share in Christ. Let's pray. Friends, brothers and sisters, I'm give you a moment now to respond to the truth John has shared with us in love this morning the gospel of who Jesus is and what he's done for us and also what is at stake if we waver from it. Would you take a moment to reflect and pray marinate on, on this truth as the Lord the Holy Spirit leads you right now?